On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass student Maura Murray drove from her dorm in Amherst, Massachusetts to the White Mountains of New Hampshire. At approximately 7.27 p.m., Maura spun out her 1996 Saturn on a hairpin turn on Route 112 in North Haverhill. There has never been a credible sighting of Maura since. Maura is five foot, seven inches tall. She weighs 120 pounds, and she has brown hair and hazel eyes. If you have any information regarding Maura's disappearance, please submit it to us, the Murray family through their Facebook page, or the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit. This is Missing Maura Murray. Welcome back to Missing Maura Murray. I am Tim here today with Lance in the Crawl Space Studios in Wormtown. Lance, how are you today? Doing very well. How are you today? I'm doing great. And today on this episode, Lance, we are going to talk to Maggie Freeling, of course, from Oxygen's The Disappearance of Maura Murray. She's going to come on to talk about new updates in the Maura Murray case and things she's learned from law enforcement about new leads. This was an item of discussion that really we ignored until we couldn't ignore it anymore, mostly because of the irresponsible nature in which it was disseminated to the public out there. So we're going to go over that with Maggie a little bit, and she graciously gives us some of her time in between filing papers to convict a murderer in New York. I'm not sure what she's doing, but she uh, took some time out of her day, so she was in a courthouse during this recording, and it's... Um, Pretty fascinating what we got out of her. But before we do, we wanted to mention that you should check out Stitcher Premium and our creator commentary episodes that we're doing for Stitcher Premium. Oh, that's cool. I heard about the creator commentary, um, Stitcher Premium. So you just get the creator commentary? No. So what we're doing, Lance, is we're doing creator commentary, which is kind of like a director's commentary on a film DVD. I see. And uh, we're talking over our old episodes, and there's episodes 1 through 10 are now available on Stitcher Premium. you got to sign up at stitcherpremium.com. It's four ninety nine a month. You can use code MMM and get a free month, but no. There is so much more on Stitcher Premium than just Missing Maura Murray, Creator's Commentary, and episodes of this podcast ad-free. Well, what else do you get on Stitcher Premium? Perhaps some archived episodes of our other podcast, Crawl Space? I'm so glad you asked. That's exactly it. You get archived episodes of Crawl Space. As most people probably don't know, it costs a lot of money to keep all these episodes up on the feed. And it's just not really affordable, especially when you consider most people who are following the show have heard them already. So what we're doing is taking down old episodes of Crawl Space and when we put up new creator commentary batches of Missing More Murray, those subsequent episodes will come down from the public feed. So if you scroll all the way down to the back to the beginning of this podcast feed, you will see that episodes 1 through 10 are not there anymore. They are now on Stitcher Premium only. But in addition to those, Lance, we're also doing Empty Frames on Stitcher Premium. And Empty Frames is an art crime podcast that we started last year about the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum heist of Boston in 1990. We did 12 episodes on that, and we're back for a six-episode season two exclusively on Stitcher Premium, which kind of runs the gamut of art crime before we get back into the Isabella Stewart Gardner heist in season three. So when you sign up on Stitcher Premium, that's four ninety nine a month, but you get the first month for free with the promo code MMM. You get all of our shows. You get the back catalog of Crawl Space. You get the creator commentary of Missing More Murray delivered in batches of 10. And that's really interesting because back in the day when we did the early shows, we would deliver information that we just weren't well informed about. Perhaps we got some details wrong. 
This gives us the chance to go back and correct these details. It gives us the chance to speak directly to the audience as present Tim and Lance. It gives us the opportunity to take down some really embarrassing episodes. There, Yeah, there's some embarrassing episodes up there, and we get to, in a sense, explain where our heads were at back then. But then there's this whole other wealth of podcast exclusives that you can get on Stitcher Premium, like True Crime Garages Off the Record, or so many comedy albums. Also, Lance, we've been getting a lot of questions about what is going on to mark the 15-year anniversary of Mora's disappearance. Of course, that being February 9th, 2019, and it's rapidly approaching. So what are we planning on doing? Well, we're planning on doing something where we get together... If you want to, as a listener, light a candle for Mora, just like last year, you can post it on Twitter, on Instagram, send us the pictures, keep her in your memory, keep that date in, in your memory, February 9th. But what we want to do is shift sort of positive energy to her birthday, May 4th. We'll get together on February 9th. You and I, maybe we'll have Curtis call in or Julie or Maggie. We'll go over some of the year-by-year -year, uh, developments that happen from 2004 to the present day. But what we want to do is try not to focus so much on February 9th as we remember more of the person. So it just made more sense to go to May 4th, her birthday, and we want to do what we're calling now miles for mora this is something that came to us by one of our listeners her name is chelsea she volunteered her time and she volunteered her contact she works with the boston marathon to do some planning we're going to do a short race it's going to be in the town or in the area that mora grew up where we're working on the location we'll give all the details in a couple of weeks so a short race you sign up for that we all go to a brewery after there's going to be food beverages we'll, we'll have silent auctions giveaway all the money that is going to be raised from this uh, fundraising event will go into the GoFundMe, which who knows what will happen. Maybe we do this five years down the road and we're, we're suddenly looking at a, at a scholarship fund for somebody to go to UMass Amherst or West Point. Who knows? But this is going to be a transference of positive energy from February 9th. Again, keep that date in mind. That's an important date in Moore's life. But we want to really focus on more of the person when we're when we're thinking about anniversaries. Yeah, and when you're thinking of a fundraiser or some kind of celebration, I think it's it's nice to celebrate her life on her birthday and not on the day she disappeared. That's correct. And to reiterate, light a candle, put it out there on the social media platforms, show that you're still aware of the importance of February 9th. And we're taking a page from Bruce Maitland and Brianna Maitland's disappearance in doing this because uh, we've heard from Bruce who says he really doesn't like to celebrate the day his daughter disappeared. Of course, Brianna Maitland disappeared March 19th, 2004 from Montgomery, Vermont. And her birthday instead is the day they choose to celebrate, which falls in October. And that is when they travel to Vermont to celebrate that day. And also speaking of Bruce Maitland, check out Private Investigations for the Missing. Click on the link to his GoFundMe. That is a nonprofit organization that you and I are on the board of, along with other lawyers and people who do like copywriting and more like former law enforcement, yeah, former law enforcement, legal people and Bruce Maitland himself. This is a organization that will raise money to help pay for the expenses of private investigators for families who have loved ones who the local cold case unit or state police just don't have the resources to follow up on on a consistent basis, a lot like Mora and a lot like Brianna. Here is a quick statement that Julie Murray wrote on Facebook. She says, hi, everyone. Most of you know we are approaching the 15-year anniversary of Mora's disappearance. While 2018 was definitely a year of progress, I am hopeful that 2019 will be the year that we get a break in the case. Thank you all for your steadfast determination and helping to keep Mora's case alive. To that end, this year we want to continue the tradition started last year and light up the sky for Mora. So, wherever you are, light up a candle in solidarity at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on February 9th, 2019. Take a picture, video, snap, whatever, and send it in to the Murray's Facebook page so they can share it with the community. So let's show Mora that when Fred said, we are coming for you, kid, he meant all of us. Let's make 2019 the year, guys. Thank you so much. And this is from the Murray's. Somebody knows something. Hashtag strength in numbers. Okay, so we just want to read a few emails here. Here's one from Ben. Ben is kind of a frequent emailer, so we just want to say thanks for the emails, Ben. He says, I recently was on a long flight and saw a cool, low-budget movie named Searching. The similarities between the movie and Maura Murray case are so obvious that he thinks the writer must have had Maura Murray in mind when he wrote it. 
and then he asks us if we've seen it, and I, I have not seen it. I am aware of the movie, and I guess it is kind of uh, shot and done all through technology, like through screenshots and text messages and video shot from the person's phone is looking on the phone looking for his daughter. It's a really well-received, critically acclaimed movie. Extremely, yeah. So I think it is a, a really interesting idea for a movie, and I do want to see it. And thank you for the recommendation, um, Benjamin. We really appreciate that. Here's one from Richard. He says, I live in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. As I was driving today, I noticed a car parked out in front of a restaurant that appears to be the same color, make, and model of the mid-90s Saturn that Mora was last seen driving. I, in fact, feel confident it is an exact match. It compelled me enough to pull over and take a closer look. What made it even more compelling is the car appeared to be beat up in a similar manner to the photos of the Saturn I've seen stored in police evidence. Most notably, the front of the car was damaged, hanging down in a similar fashion. What are the chances that Mora's car has somehow made it back to the public or that that original Saturn found was not hers? I know it's far-fetched, but the sitting of the car, but the sighting of the car stuck with me, and I wanted to message you guys about it. Lastly, do you regularly have people message you about seeing this sort of thing? Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the message, Richard. And I would say not exactly. We don't typically get emails like that. Um, we get people who talk about seeing a similar car to hers, a similar Saturn, maybe around the same year with damage. And that makes them think about uh, how the damage was caused on her car. But we've never had anybody uh, ask about that car specifically being brought back into um, circulation in the public, we can say with 99.9% .9 certainty that that her car is not in circulation with the public unless there's something that's happened under wraps that yeah, we're not aware of. Yeah, in the past year or two. Yeah. yeah, I would say it's a highly, highly unlikely that that's actually uh, more his car. So, uh, but, but thank you for the email. Yeah, and You know uh, what's cool is that you're in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and you're still thinking about Mora and who knows what might shake loose in your head. We were talking about our create creator commentary and going back to stuff that just kind of shakes loose. We had a moment during our conversation where we're like, Oh, I never thought of that. Yeah. So keep, keep that, keep that coming, keep those emails coming and, and keep looking around for Saturns with damage. And here's another email, this one from Peter. He says, to start off, I am only on episode 47 of your podcast. He says, I'm trying to get all the way through, but a little behind. I do find your podcast very entertaining and sometimes very frustrating. He says, I assume that is by design. Either way, good job. And yeah. I, I guess it wasn't by design when we started, but we recognize that it can be frustrating. And so I suppose in not changing the approach too much, we, we recognize that it is uh, frustrating at times as well. So Peter goes on to say, I am a sheriff's deputy currently. I have been in law enforcement for 14 years. I have been in public service even longer as a firefighter, EMT, and search and rescue volunteer for 22 years. I was a deputy coroner for a while and went to college studying natural resources where I went through seasonal officers training for the National Park Services. I have spent most of my free time outdoors, not an expert. I'm well-rounded in several aspects of the case, but he wants to reiterate that he is not an expert. He says he's never been to where Moore went missing, but he has been to Massachusetts and a lot of the states in New England. He says that the idea that police and emergency service workers do things perfectly every time is just flat wrong. They are dealing with chaotic situations with very little information in a rapidly evolving situation. They are humans, therefore faulty, and usually have little more training than the bare minimum to hold a position. And then he goes on, he says one of his opinions is he thinks John Smith should get off of his high horse, let go of whatever issue he has with police, parentheses, warranted or not, and parentheses, and remove this bias from his investigation. He says it's not helping, it is hindering, mistakes may have been made, dispatch may not have logged someone on scene by mistake, and they may not have logged someone on scene on purpose because they are the chief. He says, the state police may have been helping but didn't want to write a report, so he didn't tell his dispatch what he was doing. There are a million reasons why something happened that may have been normal or that do not need to be investigated or wasted time on. They could be learned from but will likely have no bearing on this case at all. 
well, keep listening to the rest of the podcast, and we'll get into a little bit of uh, John Smith later on in this episode. But I think it's a fair point coming from a police officer. He kind of noticed immediately that uh, that John has a bias against police, and he doesn't even say it like, do you think he does? He's saying he's got a bias towards police. Oh, yeah. He wrapped up in one paragraph what we've been talking about in online, offline. Other people have been t- telling us what John Smith has denied. He wrapped up in one paragraph, which was just direct to the point. So he says he's not saying that Mora was not abducted or killed. He's saying that it is unlikely, but he's saying these types of crimes are rare, not as rare as we would like, but rare, even more rare in rural Vermont, he says. However, I truly believe you treat all cases like this as a homicide until you know any different. Again, I don't think the officers did anything wrong initially, but at some point you have to pull the trigger and start to think foul play after a reasonable amount of time. I'm not going to speculate on this case what a reasonable amount of time is, as I do not know the facts of the case. But what is probable to him is that Mora is deceased in or around the area where she went missing, and he says due to natural causes. This is a great example of critical thinking. This email is well thought out, and it doesn't take sides, and it goes to this man's experience. It speaks to his experience, and it speaks to his critical thinking. I love this. He says, when people are stressed, they do really, quote, unquote, dumb things. And it's not really their fault. Some of it is biological. It is a fact that you cannot make a rational decision when your heart rate is extremely elevated. If you do not have planned or trained for that exact scenario, you will do whatever is natural to you, fight or flight. Even if you have trained, it is hard to act on your plan. It takes practice and the right mindset, mainly just to calm yourself down. I also like where he talks about the searches. He says, I've been on several searches where we found the victim well after the initial search, right in the area where they were initially thought to have been. It's not easy. They never look like what you imagine. How many times have you lost something in your own home, garage, or life? Sometimes you go over the same area several times. Look right over the object because you're not looking for it in the state you found it, but you're looking for it in the state you last remember it. If searchers were out looking for a body, and he puts in quotes, searchers and body, In all of the searching they did, it was nearly a waste of time. They should have been looking for clues, footprints, clothing, personal affects, trash, cigarette butts, pocket lint, etc. He says he knows of a searcher who came back to a command post with a shopping bag of, quote, micro trash. That's wrappers, cigarette butts, and the like. And was happy and felt they did a good job while out searching by cleaning up the trail, too. Which makes sense, I guess. This volunteer searcher was actually more like an evidence destruction technician than they ever knew, just due to lack of experience. So I thought that was saying, a great... Yeah, so he's saying they actually destroyed evidence even though they thought they were helping. Right, and to, but, but it wasn't their fault. Yeah. It was the perception that they're going out searching for a body and they're, they're looking for anything possible that they can to go back and say, I found this, it might be related, having no idea that they just destroyed evidence. And he says, because of statements on your podcast like, quote, they didn't see footprints, so she didn't walk off the road, end quote, or the volunteer that went on weekends with the dad and said, quote, they would never hide a body uphill, so we just didn't need to look up there, end quote. He said he gets really frustrated. These are not conclusions or facts. They're just opinions. I could get behind a statement like, quote, it is likely she didn't walk off the road because person X didn't see footprints, end quote. I would argue, however, did person X see footprints but believed they were accounted for caused by a searcher or emergency response person? Surely if police fire EMS, a tow truck driver, and the guy that drives the bus, and who knows who else was on the scene, someone at some point stepped in the snow and left a footprint, no? Makes total sense. Just one of these things that gets lost because you can't see the forest from the trees sometimes. We keep saying there are no footprints going into the snow. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess there were because there was a bunch of people at the scene at some point, and they were all putting their footprints in the snow. What was not in the snow were footprints when they searched in the subsequent days. He says it sounds to me like a full and thorough search led by professional and organized parties who are knowledgeable in the area, terrain, and lost person behavior has not been done. Until this has been completed, I would argue that the most likely place Maura Murray will be found is the area she was last seen deceased due to the environment injury or both if she is ever found. But we can counter that with your favorite guy from the New Hampshire Fishing Game. Todd Bogardis from the Disappearance of Maura Murray TV show. How many people have never been found in the woods under his watch? He says two. Two, one of them being Maura Murray. 
Yeah. So you can kind of counter that. And when he says that um, a, a thorough search by professionals and organized parties need to happen, I think that has, I think the New Hampshire fishing game would constitute a group of people who know the area and know the terrain. Yeah, but with that said, uh, it, it can't it can't hurt to do more. It can't hurt to do another search, and he he goes on exactly. to say exactly. I would never say to stop following leads, but he says he believes the best use of resources would be an extensive ground search of the area. Awesome, awesome, good. So thank you very much to Pete for the email. We really appreciate that, and uh, thanks for listening. Tell your uh, your other uh, partners to listen too. Okay, and before we play the call with Maggie, we just wanted to uh, let you know about a new podcast that we have uh, recorded an interview for. It's called Slim Turkey, Lance. Uh, kind of an odd name, especially for a true crime podcast. But it is about an unsolved murder that happened in Fishkill, New York, on I-84. A man named Richard Adderson was killed after having some kind of altercation on the highway where, where he got into an accident with this other man and pulled off the road and this guy Adderson was shot by the other driver who drove off. And this was in February of 1997? That's correct. And Adderson was a New York school administrator so we're not talking about somebody who typically I guess would act in an irrational manner. So what we're looking at here, right, should be a simple case of road rage and someone had a gun. Yeah, sort of. But what I think what makes it more complicated is that Adderson has a nine-minute 911 call that he placed uh, describing his killer and describing New Hampshire license plates on the car being driven by the killer. So that is kind of where... We we don't have too much more information, and I mean, we're not diving into this. There's a guy named Lee Purchase who is diving into it, and we do an interview with him. What's really amazing, I think, Lance, about this is that Lee Purchase, a pseudonym, is not a, he's a police officer. So what makes this stand out to you as not your typical run-of-the-mill true crime investigative podcast? Other than the title, Slim Turkey, I would say that... What's really interesting about it is that this podcast is done by a police officer going under a pseudonym. And this this case is way out of his jurisdiction. So he's just doing it on his own accord. Additionally on that, isn't there some speculation that the killer himself was a cop? Well, apparently that the killer told Richard Adderson that he was a cop. Uh, whether or not he really is has never been proven, and I'm prone to believe that he wasn't a police officer because of some of the details that we get into with Lee Purchase on his show, Slim Turkey. Check out the show. I mean, I think it's really interesting, and I know we have a lot of listeners from New Hampshire who may be familiar with this case and may even have information about this killer. It really is a great show. And the questions that I'm asking you, I know the answers to already, or I know the answer that you're going to give me because we'll be sitting in our studio and we'll be working on something. And then out of the blue, you'll just start talking about this because it 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 kind of simultaneously fascinates and infuriates you. Yeah. And and Mr. Lee Purchase reached out to us a couple of weeks ago for an interview. And uh, so we're, we're actually going to have him on Crawl Space. So stay tuned after the interview with Maggie Freeling. And we're going to play an exclusive clip from our chat with Lee Purchase that will be on next week's Crawl Space. So obviously subscribe to Crawl Space to get that. But in the meantime, check out Slim Turkey. Really interesting show. And here is the interview with Maggie Freeling. Follow her on Twitter at Maggie Freeling. So, Maggie, how's it going? It is going. It is going. I, am I echoing? I'm in, I'm in the courthouse. Well, what are you doing in the courthouse? It's, uh, the sound sounds fine. Okay, good. Um, I'm just grabbing some records on a, on a case I'm looking at. Oh, care to share? Divulge. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, it's not a missing or a murdered person. It's a, a person who is facing um, a murder charge. So Okay. More to come. Interesting. Someone facing come. a murder yeah. charge. 
So Maggie, let's talk about what's been going on in the community. As you know, there have been some uh, rumblings of of some GPR, ground penetrating radar that was done uh, about cadaver dogs having positive hits. And uh, and if you don't know what we're talking about, uh, there have been Reddit threads on this, and they were started, I believe, by John Smith. Uh, so Maggie, what what have you heard about this lead? Well, I've heard a lot about this, specifically that uh, there was no involvement by John Smith other than he was asked not to show up, and he did show up, and then released all of this information against the family's will. But with that said, it is information that seems like it's something that, you know, time and time again, we're seeing that it's just not going anywhere. Um, It's another instance, you know, the family's gotten their hopes up. They, you know, had some people do GPR and get some dogs. And from what I have heard from law enforcement is that it, it doesn't seem to be much. Okay. Okay. I want to go back real quick. You said that uh, John Smith was not to show up. And where was he not to show up? At the property. Um, you know, as we all know, he, he does speak with Fred. And from what I understand, he was asked not to show up because they did not want media. They did not want press that they were allowed to go to were given. They did not want a lot of people there. He was asked not to show up because once again, he had no involvement in any of this coordination at all. This was all a Fred Murray on his own. And um, he showed up even though he was asked not to. And then not only did he show up, but he put all of this information online that should not have been put online. So Fred sourced this lead, or did this lead come in to John? I don't know on that. Okay. Um, I know I know that this was, you know, a property of interest to Fred, whether it came from John or not. I know that Fred was working with his own private investigator, not John. John is not a private investigator. Um, so he was working with his own private investigator who, you know, we had known of over the summer when we were doing our own uh, GPRs and, and dogs. And that's the person who I'm thinking might have gotten this lead for him. And then they organized all the GPR together. And this company that you speak of is a really reputable company, if it's the same company that we're thinking of, um, the same one that did, did similar uh did, did something similar to what we did when we went up there and we ended up sort of working hand in hand. We didn't really meet them, but it was, it, it, it was never a competition thing is what I'm trying to say. Is this the same company that you're talking about? I believe so. Okay. Uh, it's, it seems to be the same um, private investigator he was working with and the same, same company. Gotcha. Just a different location that they identified. So have police searched this, new, this property since this new lead developed? So from what I understand, this is not a new lead. It seems to be something that's new to us, to Fred, to the family. Um, but the police have said they have searched it, searched it at least three times back in the day, back in 04, 05, you know, back when they were aggressively searching with dogs. So, okay, so you're saying that the police searched this place years ago with dogs? Yes, from what I understand from uh, law enforcement. Okay, and the word is is that this place was searched years ago three times with cadaver dogs by law enforcement, and they cleared it each time. I think I haven't heard the word cleared, but they have found nothing of evidentiary value. Okay, good. Thank you for correcting me. And so we know that it was three times, at least three times it was searched? At least three times. Why was the property searched in the first place? You know, from what we have heard from... uh, The John Smith um, hosting is that, you know, it seems to be there was a concrete slab from what my best guess would be, as I'm sure yours would be. This goes back to all those rumors of concrete slabs, which, you know, did start in the first year or so of her disappearance. So I imagine this is the same property that would go back to the concrete slab and, you know, someone poured concrete over her rumors. So if... If the police are pretty sure that this isn't Mora, but there are dogs currently in 2018 that have reacted in a way that would indicate a body there, what are we to believe? Are we to believe this is uh, like an old property that that buried their family's dead? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, It doesn't 
the police don't seem to be making much of it. Do I want them to go and check it out? Of course. I don't know what they plan to. It doesn't seem like they have moved yet. You know, from speaking with the family, they haven't heard much from them. It seems like they are very confident it's nothing. But I don't know. I think, you know, they trust their dogs and that's that. I think if they were going to go back, they would once again bring their their dogs. That's all my, you know, speculation based on what we have seen them do and, and understand from them. This is how the information goes out in this case. There's a tweet from John Smith saying, imagine if there was no house at all, just a lot. So he's putting out information that this location is not a house. This is public. I'm not saying anything that's not public that he didn't put out. He's saying this location is not a house. Imagine it to be just a lot. Yeah, I don't know. I I don't know. Um, you know, and as you guys know, I don't really actively follow what, you know, the rumor mill online. I know that I people, I guess the property might have been posted, never followed up on whose it is. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if you guys have. Um, the only things that I know is, you know, speaking to law enforcement and, and hearing that um, they have searched this. It doesn't seem to be a, a priority for them right now. Yeah. Do you know if they're planning to go back at any point, maybe in the spring or something? I would hope that they do. Um, my confusion is just, you know, if they had dogs there and found nothing of evidentiary value, why would, would dogs be hitting on a property, you know, 14 years later? They had, to, you know what I mean? Like, I think we're all a little maybe confused about that. Definitely. I'm confused on that. Yeah, because it sounds like a promising lead. Well, yeah. here's the problem. This is how we all got into a sticky situation way back in the day when there was a bunch of information out there and people started taking what they wanted to, uh, taking information that they wanted from it. And I'm talking about like the A-frame house where the cadaver dogs went bonkers. Bonkers became this thing. And then we find out that bonkers isn't a thing that cadaver dogs do when they hit on a dead body. From Reddit, right. from Reddit there's a post about this hit and there's a note that says this has nothing to do with the A-frame, Rick Forster's property, or any other location that has been looked at before. This is all new information that was recently obtained by the team, which was identified in the post earlier on as being a small, dedicated group of people working with Fred Murray, including John Smith. So this right here was a public post put out there about information that's significant to Moore's disappearance narrowing down every other place that had been searched so whoever did this can look at that and say they might be closing in on me. There is absolutely no reason to put this out. We know that the family was upset about this being put out. You know, you we all speak with members of the family often um, and it's it's reckless and it, it, it could be detrimental at times. But do we know what the family thinks about this lead? Do, are, are they optimistic about this? Yeah, so when this came out, you know, I obviously spoke with um, certain people in the family to see if there's any validity to it, to see if they knew this was out there. Obviously, a lot of people had been reaching out to them about this, and they were very upset that this was out there. That was, it was very upsetting. But they, you know, they did, they, it was hopeful to them. They did, they, you know, they were hoping. They had talked to law enforcement and said, like, you know, are you going to look at this? And it seems like law enforcement kind of said the same thing to them that I understand. You know, it does. It, they don't seem to think this is something of priority interest. So, I don't know. It, it would be nice if they checked it out. Um, I think everything should be checked out. I think we all agree with that. But I don't know if it will be. Well, there is another post that says, as you can see from the screenshot from Twitter, it would seem that Maggie has contacted the New Hampshire State Police. I suspect that would be Chuck West. From the comment by Maggie, it would appear that, law, that the law enforcement entity she spoke of was not forthcoming with any info, or is Maggie fabricating her comment to defuse the situation? What comment is that exactly that Maggie made? I think I've said the same thing that I've said from the beginning because I immediately spoke with the family and law enforcement and it's been the same since that this is the property. 
Johnson had nothing to do with it. He was specifically asked him not to come. As we've seen with his hiding in the bush stunts before, it was a similar situation. He got someone to drive him there. He was not picked up by the family. He asked, you know, someone in the community to drive him to this location. And he inserted himself once again. And now it is a detriment. So, if there's any validity to, you know, some in this having something to do with Mora. So I'm giving uh, you the opportunity to answer these questions, which seem like they were really important questions when it was posted on Reddit. Um, the the post then asks you, why do you have your fingers crossed if uh, if this wasn't um, if this wasn't anything that law enforcement was taking seriously? Fingers are always crossed. I think we're all always crossing our fingers. I mean, just because law enforcement, and I wouldn't even say they're not taking it seriously they take everything seriously they have said that they've searched this before um multiple times three times at least fingers always crossed maybe they did miss something i would like for them to go check it so does this mean that law enforcement gave you some type of info that would bring you to keep your fingers crossed no okay by the way then there was a a correction sort of a pseudo redaction on all of this saying it's important to note that the two positive hits from the cadaver dogs did not positively identify Maura Murray's body. So all of this information that went out there was pseudo redacted because someone could get in trouble by putting it out there. And along the course of this, Maggie, you sort of got dragged into it as if you had some information that you weren't sharing because you said your fingers were crossed. No, I don't have any information I'm not sharing. That happened in about a month. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, was saying that um, this no, is, I don't this, have any information I'm not sharing. This is how it all goes down. We, we, we identified this years ago, and we're identifying it now. There's this information that's put out there. It's too much information because someone needs to feed their own ego. They drag you into it, Maggie, saying that you have some knowledge, whether it's from law enforcement or somebody else, because you're saying you literally said you had your fingers crossed. And then... Things have to get pulled back because someone's going to get in trouble for putting something out there that's not true. Yeah. I mean, I, first of all, I wouldn't even say I'm involved. I don't involve myself in that whole scene of, you know, drama starters, why, you know, people that are making stuff up. I mean, we, you guys, you know, we've all traced some of these rumors back to John Smith at the beginning of this case. I mean, he is a completely uncredible source of information. It is, it is really really devastating and upsetting and it's not really worth uh acknowledging anymore and i think we haven't acknowledged it anymore but you know this is unfortunately something that he did that needs to be addressed good i just have one more thing to read i just want the update the latest update from a tweet from john smith on thursday january 10th it has come to our attention that the new hampshire state police cold case unit has indicated that they have no intention of looking at the location where recent viable evidence has been found until at least the spring of 2019, if at all. Yeah, that sounds that sounds about right. Right. Well, that must be because the, it's a conspiracy of silence, right? Exactly. It's a conspiracy of silence. Also, I don't know how you could call the information viable if there's, I mean, I'd like to see some reports. You know, I'd like to see some video evidence. I don't know. You know, who's calling this viable? Yeah, that's fair. Um and so pivoting out, out of that conversation, Maggie, um, Maura Murray's ex-boyfriend, Bill Rausch, has resurfaced on social media and on Twitter specifically, and he's been commenting about the case. Uh, how do you feel about uh, Bill Rausch resurfacing? Why now? Why didn't you resurface a decade ago? And you tried to call him for the, the oxygen disappearance of Maura Murray's show, and it, you never got a response. Is that accurate? Yeah, I didn't I didn't personally ever reach out to him. Um, producers reached out to him. I know they spoke with him. I don't remember the content. I don't I don't remember specifically what was said, but I think he, you know, respectfully declined to be part of the documentary. What I would want to know is like, why are you surfacing now? Like why why now? Um, we gave you an opportunity on the documentary to wish plus years ago. Um, so my question is, you know, why now? I don't know in what context he surfaced. I don't know anything about that. I don't follow him on Twitter. I don't follow, you know, the, the Twitter drama, but um, I'm, I'm just curious why now and like in what capacity has he surfaced? 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think he holds the answers to a lot of questions that the community wants to know about Mora's disappearance specifically. Well, I think the other thing to think of is, you know, myself, when I think about, um, you know, interviewing somebody like him, he is in the political realm. He is very media savvy. Would he ever even be honest answering any questions? Why would he not be if he's if he's talking about things that uh you know about Mora's disappearance or about their relationship or things like that? Um, you know, if they did get in an argument on that phone call, why would he make want to make himself look bad? You know, we've always heard about him not being the greatest boyfriend. Would he even be honest about that? Would he be honest to say, Yeah, I was not a good boyfriend, yeah, I cheated on her? You know, I think there are legitimate reasons why he's disappeared for so long and I'm wondering why he's surfacing now and is he going to be honest in answering questions when he does answer them? Maybe possibly providing us with information on any evidence that he might have passed to law enforcement that we hear in the circles that they didn't do any quote unquote do anything with. You know, he might know something about the voicemail that he thought was Mora but it's a Red Cross call. He might know something about that that he could say you know, here's my feeling on it. Here's what I was feeling then. Here's what I'm feeling now. And I did pass that out to, you know, that voicemail. I passed that off to law enforcement. So maybe maybe that happened. Maybe it didn't. But I think I think in the past, him thinking that he should come out and say something like that probably wasn't as important as it is now for some reason. Back then, he was probably thinking, if I open my mouth, I'm going to invite myself to be criticized. And who knows what kind of person people will make me out to be just based on a couple of tweets. So why now? I mean, I feel well, that's, like the yeah, trolling that, is worse now than it ever has been. That's like, what I'm why saying. Now? Yeah, exactly. I think back then there was probably a reason to not disrupt his lifestyle and his family to, to, to remain quiet. And that made sense to him because again, he probably didn't want to, he was probably looking at it and saying anybody, whether it's him or whoever, whenever somebody gives their opinion or, or just put something out there, they just open themselves up to so much criticism and he's got a career. You said he's in politics. So he's like, I'm not going to do that to myself. That's just me being, you know, theorizing what he was thinking back then. Now something's happened that have brought him more to the forefront. I'm not sure what that is. I'm not sure why, but maybe it is time for him to go out there and say, here are some details that I know you guys talk about that involve myself and Mora, and I want to clear these up. Yeah. I, I hope, you know, he talks to you guys. I think that would be a wonderful interview. Um, I think you guys could ask him some hard questions, and I, I would hope he would be honest. Well, we've uh, said publicly and privately that the door is always open for him to come on the show and talk about more of their relationship and some of the uh, moments that happened before and after her disappearance. Now, one other topic I wanted to talk about, Maggie, and address with you here is uh, one of the Facebook moderators from the Murray Family Facebook page. His name is Scott, and he has been running uh, that page, co-running that page with Troy for a long time. And he posted recently, and uh, I thought it was really interesting. It was about Mora's, the, the damage on Mora's car and where that could have happened. And uh, it was stuff I had never heard before, so I messaged with him a little bit about it, just making sure we could use this. And uh, he is considering coming on the show soon, too. But, um, but we figured we could get back into this. But I just wanted to get your opinion on this, and I wanted to read a little bit of this, okay? Mm-hmm. Scott says, I don't comment often, but I just thought there were a few things I need to share. I've spoken to a witness who has never come public. They saw Mora's car right after the accident, but before police arrived. They said where she hit the snowbank used to be some small trees slash brushes. The position of her car damage and description of their view of the accident matches up. Within a few days, someone came in and cut the trees down. He goes on to say he believes that based on the statements that uh, the witness made, that the damage was made by Mora hitting the snowbank and the small trees, brushes, which apparently were cleared not long after that. He says most people don't know the full picture of the accident, so speculation has ballooned over the years. From everything he knows, there is no mystery to the accident. No other vehicle has ever been proven to have been involved. And he said investigators did some damage to the front of the car after the accident uh, to in order to access under the stuck hood is what he said. 
So he said that Uh some investigators actually damaged that hood further. So the pictures that we've seen are not exactly indicative of what the damage looked like after the accident. Yeah, you guys knew this already. We knew that. I don't recall that. Yeah, and we we knew there was a lot of damage afterwards. But, you know, that happened, and then it was in the lot for a while. I mean, especially the photo that we see now is not at all how it looked. Yeah, I mean, there, there's been a lot of talk about the car over the years, a lot of speculation. Maybe the damage on the car happened elsewhere. And I think it's interesting to trace it all back and say that, look, investigators actually did some of the damage on the hood. And there are trees that aren't there now that actually did most of the damage on the car. And so right. it's Scott's opinion and point um, that he spoke to a witness who said that. And so he is pretty sure about that damage having taken place there and I, th- I guess that's only relevant to spike the theories that might be put out there that there was uh, some previous accident or some trailer hitch that Mora hit or whatever right yeah and that's great I hope he comes on your podcast any conversation I've had with him has been really wonderful so thanks Maggie for joining us hey uh what are you doing on May 4th 2019 Mora's birthday is two days before my birthday so I'm actually going to be away in Vegas Oh, that's too bad. So on uh, Mora's birthday on May 4th, Saturday, May 4th, we're going to be doing the fundraiser Miles for Mora. It's going to be a short uh, race that's going to be local to where Mora grew up, followed by a fundraiser at a brewery. We're going to give out the details in a couple of weeks, and uh, the fundraiser will include giveaways, silent auctions, etc., all going to the GoFundMe account. Awesome. That is so cool, guys. And are you planning on doing anything for the 15-year anniversary of Mora's disappearance? Um, Well, I wanted to talk to you guys about that and the family. Um, I did receive a call from WAMU, um, who is doing a TV spot for the anniversary. Um, So I'm very glad that there will be media attention on Mora on the anniversary. Um, Very glad that they are doing that. Um, And other than that, I think we should uh, talk again. Well, Tim and I were talking, and because we're doing something for her birthday in May, we were thinking that, and we know that to celebrate or to recognize someone's the anniversary of someone disappearing, that, that brings up a lot of bad emotions, a lot of negative emotions for the family. Maybe we keep it simple and do the candle lighting. People can send that to the Twitter, to the Instagram, and we can uh, go back to some early articles, read those, just sort of do a a year-by-year account of what's happened in 15 years, but not really put the spotlight on February 9th anymore as far as remembering Mora, but moving that towards May 4th. I like that a lot. So if you want to uh, join us for February 9th, whether you call in or maybe we could get together, we'll go over some of the early newspaper articles. We'll talk some stories with um, with Curtis and, and Julie. Maybe we can bring up uh, some of the stories that they uh, shared with us during the Facebook Live episode that we did last anniversary. But again, we really want to take the focus of Mora, put it on her birthday. When people get together, and sometimes it feels like a celebration, and this isn't really a day to be celebrated. We should celebrate the day she was born, not the day that she was taken or disappeared. Okay, and here's a clip of our upcoming episode of Crawl Space featuring Lee Purchase. Even though I sent you that email asking if you would be a guest on my show, I I want to just tell you one thing, um, and this is really heartfelt. I have to get it out there. Missing Maura Murray was the first podcast that I had ever listened to, and that was February 2018. Um, And after listening to it, you guys really inspired me to begin my own show. So I owe you guys a double thanks for not only the inspiration, but then to actually agree to be on my show so i really want to thank you and um this means a lot to me wow well thank (laughs) yeah thanks a lot that that means a lot to us and uh you know your show is really good and uh you know we, we we do get some requests from time to time but i think your show is different not only just because of the title of it but uh you're a police officer. You're you're a current day police officer, and I think to me, 
that is sort of validation a little bit of what we do at here at Missing More Murray and Crawl Space. And I, I also th- think that I'm not, I'm not sure that that's happened yet. A true crime podcast done by a current police officer on a case out of outside of his jurisdiction, and you're going under a pseudonym. And I just really think it's a kind of like a cultural moment. Yeah, it's a remarkable. Yeah, it's a cultural moment. It's a remarkable moment. But it's a great show, and there's like a genuineness to it that is really appealing. And I hope a lot of ears get turned to to this show. It's a sad case, and and you're doing a great job. Uh, covering it so far, and it's it's really infuriating. And so I think this uh, that your podcast, and I definitely wouldn't underestimate the impact that it can have. This this story pisses me off. It's first of all the whole incident is tragic, and then for Richard Anderson, who is the you know the victim in this, to crawl back to his car. And this was in the early days of cell phones. Um, he crawls back to his car to get his cell phone and he calls 911 and winds up staying on the phone for nine minutes. And in those nine minutes, he provided the 911 operator with a wealth of information. Unfortunately, and this, this is one of my biggest problems with the, uh, the, the police, is that they've never released the full transcript of that 911 call and they've never released more than 20 to 30 seconds of it. And I can actually understand why you wouldn't release the call itself, right? Because there's a lot of emotion, I'm sure. Um, They did release one, they released one part of it where Richard is telling the 911 operator, I didn't deserve this. It's, it's, It's heartbreaking. But if you release the transcript and put some more information out there, I don't, I don't see what the harm is, especially after so much time has passed. You know, what you said, that that has become infuriating to me because I don't see any harm in it. And if you want to release the transcript and redact information, I, you, the only thing that I could ever think of was that Richard Addison possibly gave a partial license plate number. That's what I believe. And that's just a theory, and I could be 100% wrong. But within five days of his shooting, New York State Police were up in Manchester, New Hampshire. So they had some lead that brought them right up to um, Manchester. And why Manchester, out of all places? So they go up to Manchester and say, say Richard did release a partial plea, and it brought them up there. So redact that, because they're always going to be people with that you know, pitchfork mentality, burning whatever, you know, to try to go and, and be a vigilante. For sure. Cover that information. I understand that would that could potentially lead to some innocent person being, um, you know, misidentified as the killer. Don't release that information, but release, release more information that would really engage the public in helping to solve this crime. Totally agree. Yeah, the, to think that there's a nine-minute call and only about 30 seconds has been out there is is disappointing. I, I kind of thought maybe because this killer seems to have told Richard Adderson that he was a cop, I thought my, my head went to they probably didn't put it out there because he might have said it a few more times and kind of the exact same thing that, that you said, you don't want uh, the people with pitchforks getting angry. Well, I think a lot of that anger would have been directed towards the police if they heard him say that. And I think there is still a pretty good chance that this guy, the killer was not a cop. Yeah. You know, it's, I, um, I related to my own personal experience and before I was a cop, I remember um, I lived in, in Queens, New York at the time, and I had school, and then I had an internship, and I was coming home late one night, and the train was, it was it, it pretty much had no one on it, I think maybe five people, and some guy was doing something to this woman, and I walked over to the guy, and I just said, very matter-of-factly, please don't make me come back on duty. And the guy got a little scared and he moved cars. 
I didn't say I was a cop. I wasn't a cop at the time. I sort of implied it. And I think that I did because I just got excited and scared. And there were a lot of emotions running through me at that point. And I said it. And that could have been the same mentality that this person had. He got scared. He was uh, using it as an intimidation tactic. Yeah. And Richard Adderson was a big guy. He was about 6'1", six, 6'2", six, uh, well over 200 pounds. He was a black belt in judo. Um, so he knew how to take care of himself. And, you know, he was just an imposing presence. And, and this guy was described as six feet tall, thin, maybe even on the frail side. Um, and it's easy to get it's easy to get intimidated in yeah. those situations, especially when, you know, people lose their cools. Yeah, I wanted to talk about his appearance a little bit because this is what tells me or at least makes me lean in the direction that he's not a police officer because uh, the composite sketches, he looks just like, uh, like you said, frail. Like, I don't know, I, I haven't seen many police officers that are frail. I he think. looks like an accountant. Yeah, I mean, I think, and you can speak to this, but I think most uh, police officers are probably encouraged to uh, stay in very good shape and work, at least work out and not be frail. Is that accurate? No. No. So my first impression when I heard that he could possibly be a cop, and then you talk about age. So he was described anywhere from 40 to 50 years old, and then another description came out that said he might have been in his late 40s to early 50s. You know, just like we're all individuals, um, cops are all individuals. As well, what I thought was that it could have possibly been a police officer who had been on the job for some time, had uh, risen the ranks, and was no longer dealing with the public on a daily basis. Someone who may have been behind the desk or a head of, an, a, head of a department could be in his 50s. Okay. And that physical description didn't make me think that this wasn't a cop. I thought it was very possible that it could have been a cop of some power who had risen the ranks in whatever department he was in. I think that's an interesting point. Um, I just want to mention the other couple of things that made me think it was probably not a cop. And again, I, I need you to uh, speak to this for me because I don't know many cops personally, but... The eyeglasses uh, seems like like police officers, um, at least today, I would imagine, would be encouraged to wear contacts or get LASIK surgery. I, I, I would have to, and if he's in an, an administration role, I guess this doesn't really matter. But uh, you know, as an officer, I just think you would you would not want to have glasses on because that could hurt you your ability to do your job, right? Yeah, I you know I w I would agree with that, but then. You can make the case that he was an older gentleman. Let's assume he was in his late 40s, early 50s. It's already dusk. Some people have a problem driving um, with the glare. Maybe he was wearing glasses to, to drive. Um, and I'll tell you, just me personally, when I do patrol, I will go out with funny-looking glasses just to throw people off, they don't, they're never, you know, they're never expecting a, a police officer to show up wearing funny looking women's glasses. It, it takes them back, you know, and it allows them, at least my experience, it allows them to see me as a person and not a cop. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I mean, we're, if we're talking about the glasses thing, maybe he did wear contacts while he was on duty, and then he popped those out and put the glasses on as he drove home or something. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, absolutely. Presumably, driving through New York State with New Hampshire license plates, he was off duty, right? So. Oh, good point. It doesn't matter, you know? Yeah, I guess so. You said earlier you didn't see the harm in releasing more of the 911 call were you saying that as a as a police officer or as a citizen? As a citizen. You know, when I was thinking about speaking with you today and putting myself in that situation now, 
I am not a high ranking police officer by any means. Um, and as a citizen, I would say, yeah, release that information. I don't know if I would ever want to be in the situation in that high rank where I would have to make that decision. That's a tough decision to make because ultimately the police department wants to keep their investigation close to their own vest and control it. Once you start releasing a lot of information to the public, you are inevitably, as a police department, as an investigator or as a detective, you're losing a little control of that investigation. And ultimately, that can impede the investigation. So as a citizen, I say, yeah, release it all. If you don't want to release the emotional 911 call, release the transcript. Redact whatever you have to do. But fortunately, I'm not in that position where I would have to make that decision. So I'm, I guess inevitably, I'm looking at this homicide and the investigation as a police officer, but I try as much as I can to look at it from the other perspective as well.